the good news is you know, a, a bilingual contract in China, um, you can find an English-speaking lawyer, Chinese lawyer. I think the, the um, I'm on the board of advisors with a law firm called Asia Bridge and China Bridge, and they charge maybe 400 US dollars to draft a tailor-made contract that's bilingual. So there's really no excuse for not having a bilingual contract. These are the hallmarks of a, of a good contract. Um, you first hallmark, you've got the contract with the right party. You would not believe how many buyers, um, especially if you're a new buyer, play, think you're doing business with a factory. You pay the money to their trading company in Hong Kong, and you've got a contract with an agent or a broker. No one really set out to cheat each other, but then if you need to drag somebody into court, what will inevitably happen is you think that you're taking the manufacturer to court, the judge brings them in, and uh, the manufacturer says, yeah, we've, we've got a purchase order from this Australian buyer, but we never received any funds. And you say, wait, I sent the funds to this account. Well, that's a different company. That's in Hong Kong. And then you drag the Hong Kong company into the court, and they say, yeah, we received these funds from Australia. We don't have a matching purchase order. We didn't know where they came from. We've already spent the money. You know, you, and then how do, you, how do you connect the dots? You can't. So my suggestion that I'll repeat over and over again is make sure that the name on the contract in local language matches the bank account name, ideally matches the name on the factory door or the agency that you're using, whatever. So if those three are the same, then your contract is gonna have muscle. Um, so as I mentioned, some other hallmarks of a good contract, it's readable. You know, don't, don't let the, your local lawyer in, in Sydney tell you about this 50-page watertight contract. It might not even get read. So you know, break it down. Think of it as a memo of understanding. Get it four pages or less. And when I talk about being bilingual, I don't have it like two pages English, two pages Chinese. What I would do is a, like a paragraph or a couple sentences in, in English, translate it into Chinese, and then a signature for initial it or chop it. And then I don't just hand the document to the supplier via email and say, get back to me. Let's do, a, let's do a Skype call or let's do a video call or let's meet in person at the trade show and go through each of these items one by one. And I also like to do it in front of their peers because um, if a vendor knowingly breaks the terms of contract, he's gonna lose a lot of face to his peers. So I like to make a, a, signing, a signing ceremony something special. I'm buying lunch, guys, drinks are on me, let's bring a couple of your key employees and let's do this signing ceremony together. And then we go over each of the points one by one as a group. So if the general manager um, cheats me or breaks the terms of the contract that we're explained in such easy terms for everybody to understand. His employees are going to know that he's a cheat as well. So actually that loss of face sometimes has more influence than the fear of lawyers. Okay, um, appropriate jurisdiction. We had a great supplier in Zhejiang province one time that we worked with for three years. We transferred all this technology to them and uh, we, they got really bold and they started counterfeiting our product right down to the patent number. And so now we've got a product that is counterfeit with our patent number out in the marketplace and all of a sudden our defects that were normally 2% per season went up to 15%. It almost supplier has to respect the intellectual property. So I was having so much fun, like we're gonna get to shut this guy down. I'm working with the Chinese police. I've got the full support of the lawyers. Let's go in and get him. Like the day before we're ready to go in, um, they're like, let's see the contract. Oh, I let that New York lawyer tell me to put the jurisdiction in the US because of course that lawyer wants to make money if it ever goes to court. What he didn't tell me was that uh, a win in a US court has no jurisdiction in China. There's no like extradition treaty or anything like that. So even if you were to win a court case in Australia because you're, you're first, how are you gonna get that Chinese supplier that knows you wanna sue them to come to Australia 
to come to your court system. It's not going to happen. So in the case that I was talking about with counterfeiting, we basically went quiet for two years, hired a private investigator, and waited for this Jijang supplier to show up at a trade show in Las Vegas. And because counterfeiting is a federal offense, the FBI put him in handcuffs. But it took us two years to track this guy down. If I had just put into the contract, the jurisdiction is Zhejiang Province, China, it would have been an open and shut case and we, we wouldn't have nearly the headaches. One exception. So my rule, I like to say put the jurisdiction um, near the, the factory, near the supplier, but don't put it too close if, you dealing, if you're dealing with a giant factory in a small town <laughs> because the, lawyer, the uh, judge might be the factory manager's cousin. That happens all the time. So with these giant state-owned enterprises where there's a, a village of 20,000 people and 10,000 work at the factory, in those cases, you'd want to put your jurisdiction at the nearest provincial capital, regardless of where it is in Asia. Okay, um, a, a lot of us are thinking, all right, we've got this great contract, and let's put a clause in there that if the supplier breaks the terms of the quality or lead time or intellectual property, they gotta pay a heavy penalty. And so I did that at first, and the lesson I learned was that if your penalty isn't realistic, the judge in Asia will rule it out. So you can't say, I'm buying $10,000 worth of earrings, and if the supplier gets the quality right, they have to refund me $200,000 Australian. The judge is going to say, that's not realistic. So the good news is the penalty clauses work if they're reasonable. So you're buying $10,000 worth of earrings, your contract might say you get a 2% discount for every 48 hours that the product is late on delivery. And you have a clear delivery date, the supplier has chopped it or signed it the Asian way. And you know, the, the court system actually loves those cases because they don't have to debate it. The penalty is pre-agreed so the judge looks at it and you, you, you win an award. Getting the money out of the supplier, that's another question. Hopefully they're still in business and have real assets, but that, that's another talk. So um, having the, a clear contract with clear penalty terms, believe me, it will protect you. Okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I hope there aren't any lawyers from Australia in the audience that would disagree, but my experience has been when you go to a local lawyer here in Australia, America, Europe, Often they have a partner behind the scenes that is either a, an Asian person that emigrated to Australia or a relationship with a, a Chinese law firm. And the local lawyer here gives some value added suggestions, maybe editing the English, but they tend to double or triple the cost. I've saved so much money just by working with English speaking Asian law firms to get things like contracts done, purchase orders, demand letters. So there's really, thanks to the internet, it's easy to find local lawyers that speak English, so there's, there's no excuse for not having your documents reviewed by a local lawyer, whether it's India, Taiwan, Thailand, whatever. Also, a great contract under signature isn't as good as a great contract with the official CHOP. So in mo lots of, many parts of Asia, the CHOP is a, 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 it's a physical stamp that represents the company. It doesn't matter who signs it. It's like who has possession of this red shop that is the official signature of the company, the binding. So you know, when you have this contract, it's not just the general manager's signature who may claim to be the legal representative. What if he isn't the legal representative? That signature has no value. A corporate shop, now that has real value. Now then there's a question of is that chop real or not and, and that's another discussion that, that, that we can have if you visit, visit my uh, YouTube channel. Okay, so now let's talk about quality. Where do, where do quality and contracts meet? First, my first tip is unless you're buying so simple, something so simple like a commodity, you're buying, you know, you're, you're buying Mickey Mouse watches that haven't changed in five years, okay you would assume that the factory is going to get it right. But if you're taking that Mickey Mouse watch, now you're adding a solar panel and you're putting some Brazilian leather on it, now you're making something new that maybe the supplier hasn't made before. In that case, you almost have to assume that there will be quality issues. So ask the supplier, if there are defects, who pays for the rework? Um, in my 17 years of dealing with suppliers in Asia, I've had lots of missed lead times. In 17 years, not once, if I had a supplier say to me, Mike, we missed the lead time by a week, let us pick up the FedEx charges to send the replacements to Las Vegas. 
Not once. Until I started putting into my contracts that if the lead time is missed by X days, I get X discount. And sometimes the suppliers forget about this and I get a call at the 11th hour, Mike, you know, we're friends and uh, I hope you understand, but we just got this new big order from Disney. Is it okay if I ship your watches a, a week late, Mike? You know, can you, do, can you do me a favor on this one? And my answer is always pretty much the same. Mr. Wong, you know, sorry to hear about that. And luckily I knew that this might happen because it's close to Chinese New Year, so I built in a two-week window or some padding with my customers. But more importantly, I'm so glad we have this contract in place because I could really use that 5% discount. So you take your time. I'll give you 14 days. What happens? It ships tomorrow. So <laughs> having the contract with penalties pre-agreed, and Mr. Wong can't say to me, oh, let's debate what the, what the penalty term is. No, it's in this clear contract that we went over in front of you and all your coworkers at that lunch meeting two years ago. So relationship and saving face and contract terms, they all overlap. Okay, don't do this. You make the effort to have a clear contract about lead times. And then you ask Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong, boy, my customer would love it a week early. Can you ship ahead of time? Okay. Now you're asking them a favor. Don't think that the supplier is not keeping score. Later, when they have a problem, they're going to ask the same thing to you. We're going to miss Christmas this year. Is it, is it okay if we get it in early January to you rather than early December? You know, so don't break the terms of your own contract because that leaves the supplier as an open door. Okay, um, integrate the quality manual into the contract. What I mean is, if you've taken the effort to define what are the specifications, the bill of material, even you know, social accountability issues, if you have a, a written document in place, staple it to the contract, make it part of the agreement so that God forbid something goes wrong, or even if the supplier just needs to reference, hey, what's the quality standard? They've got more than just a PO that says 10,000 units. It's 10,000 units of XYZ material processed by um, certain date. So take all the documents that you have, as long as they're read readable, and put it into this PO packet. Um, you know, realize at the end of the day that, that your supplier's mistakes, um, that's your exposure with your customer. So it's up to us to really manage the supply chain because we're, as buyers, we're on the line. Okay, intellectual property, I could do hours on this topic alone. And uh, we covered it a little bit yesterday. And um, at last year's seminar, I did a whole hour. So if, you want, if you're serious about these issues, and only a few people raised their hands, so know that if you visit um, the blog, and I'll give you the links later, we can go into this in more depth. But for now, a couple things to, to, to remember. Um, the contract itself isn't going to protect you. For example, Let's say that you have an agreement with a supplier where they're going to put your logo on their product.